Borderlands 3 is the first game I have felt legitimate hype for in years. As a fan of the Borderlands franchise and only recently playing the games on PC as opposed to console, I can safely say that this is probably one of my favourite franchises of all time, with Borderlands 2 being my favourite game ever made. But along with all the shooting, looting and the unique cell shaded style, every Borderlands game comes with a story. Now video game stories are not usually renowned for being the most <coughs> in depth stories ever told, and many games struggle to strike a balance between good and exciting games gameplay and a fantastic story. The games with good and exciting gameplay usually have either a fairly standard story or one that just plain fucking sucks. Police! And the games with a good story usually have passable gameplay or are choose your own adventure games with little to no gameplay at all. But you do very occasionally get an exception to this rule, and Borderlands 2 is an exception to me. While its story isn't anything revolutionary and has a few contrivances here and there, it manages to be funny, engaging, and surprisingly dramatic at times. All of this is done by complementing what is already a fantastic base game with fast paced and addictive gameplay, but they went above and beyond to deliver a good story for this game. It somehow manages to subvert expectations well, has some really funny writing, and has what many people consider to be one of the greatest video game villains of all time, Handsome Jack. Jack wasn't your usual run-of-the-mill video game bad guy, in the sense that not only was he consistently entertaining and charismatic, but he stuck with you throughout the entire game to give you updates on his current predicament and feelings as you progress through the story. Everything from randomly jumping in to insult you in a humorous way, to calling you a douchebag, or to just tell you he bought a diamond-encrusted pony and named it Butt Stallion. But in the later half of the game, you begin to notice a few changes in Jack. He begins to get more desperate, more aggressive, he stops toying with you as much. You begin to start getting to him and start genuinely annoying him. And once you find his daughter, Angel, you start seeing him in a different light than you did before. He's still a terrible person with no chance at being redeemed, but you get the sense that he's a broken man with how he pleads for you to stay away and not kill his daughter. He's angry on the verge of a breakdown, and once you finally kill Angel, he breaks. <laughs> He kills Roland, one of the original Vol Hunters from the first game, right in front of you, and captures Lilith with the intent to kill you. He stops screwing around with you and is now taking things seriously. What's that saying? Don't pick a fight with a man with nothing left to lose. See, I'm gonna show you just how much you have to lose, and I've got the most powerful siren on the planet to do it with. Lilith, kill the Vault Hunter. We've got a date to keep. After this, you don't get the same relationship you thought you had with Jack, as he gets more spiteful and upset and angry at everything you do, even revealing that he only kept Angel locked up because she accidentally killed her mother, something that we find out is actually true in a side mission in Borderlands 3 that had a massive effect on him mentally. And by the end of the game, along with all of the knowledge that we know about him from the pre-sequel, all we see is a broken man. He was betrayed, beaten down, and lost his wife with only his daughter left. Jack was an outstanding villain who elevated Borderlands Two's story from being pretty good to downright fantastic, which is why with Borderlands 3 promising to be more story focused, and given the warning that the Watcher gave us in the pre-sequel, and reports of there being more cutscenes in the previous games, I was expecting Gearbox to double down on what made Borderlands 2's story truly work, and to create a game that actually rivaled it. Not surpassed it, but as serviceable enough as a good story. And while they certainly made a better game than Borderlands 2 if we're talking gameplay wise, it's one of my favourite games of the year in fact, the story fell flat on its fucking face, and by the end of the game I felt unsatisfied, sour, and most interestingly to all of you, angry. So let's have a rant about it, shall we? We begin our story on Pandora, five years after the events of the Commander Lilith DLC for Borderlands 2, which had Lilith blow up Sanctuary because she hated plant life, and lost the Vault Key that contained a map to vaults all over the galaxy. So right away there is still no explanation as to why this Vault Key has a map of a metric assload of vaults on it. I thought the whole purpose of the Vault Key was to act as a key for a specific vault on a specific planet, like all of the games have handled it. Why was there just a random map on this one specific Vault Key that led to tons of different vaults 
that's located all over the galaxy. Was this supposed to be the Iridian's way of telling people to fuck off from Pandora because of the destroyer? And if so, how do they expect anyone other than a siren to access the map? Lilith just sort of touched it and the map activated by complete accident. And as we learn through Nereid's messages, sirens apparently have no clue what their purpose is or why they're even remotely tied to the Iridians. So sirens are apparently just powerful beings who have no defined origin, they just exist now. That's cool. I, I, I guess, but again, how did Lilith activate the map in the first place? And how did the Iridians expect anyone to access it anyway, Siren or not? Because I find it a fair bit unlikely that this thing came packaged with a bloody instruction manual. Christ, am I even into the first cutscene? I'm already bitching. We actually begin our story with Marcus informing us that the Crimson Raiders, now being led by Lilith, have recruited four new Vault Hunters to search for the missing Vault Key, because apparently after five years they haven't had this fucking idea yet. Seriously, why is it taking you so long to finally hire a new batch of Vault Hunters to go look for this thing? There's no indication that you hired any Vault Hunters before that. In fact, what the fuck is stopping you from searching it for yourself, Lilith? The argument of her now being the leader of the Crimson Raiders can't exactly be used for this, as Lilith basically has the ability to teleport to any place she wants to, and is one of the most powerful sirens that we know of. Bandits and Skags are most likely not going to be a problem for her, I can assure you of that. We are then told that a new threat has gripped the Borderlands in the form of the Children of the Vaults, led by Tyrene and Troy Calypso, which is a psycho cult with every possible bandit clan on Pandora united under it, as well as being allied with Malawan that have the goal of opening up the Great Vault, which- What the fuck is going on right now? Who the fuck allowed these basic as fuck Twitch streamers to rise to power and unite every bandit clan on Pandora? What the fuck have the Crimson Raiders been doing these past five years? Oh no, don't tell me this is a First Order situation, oh for fuck's sake. I am damn near close to concluding that Lilith and the Crimson Raiders must have suffered severe brain aneurysms in the five year gap between Borderlands 2 and now, because that is the only canonically sound way I see any of this making a lick of sense. These people have the goal of fucking up everything. How did you let them rise, you bucket of horse seat? This is very, Steven very bad. Especially when you have a massive army at your disposal and are known throughout Pandora as the ones who killed handsome Jack. And while we're on the topic of Jack for a second, even though it may seem jarring at first to have him suddenly be the big bad of Borderlands 2, at least it made sense given the ending of the last game. And at least this backstory and how he rose to power was actually explained in the pre-sequel. Look at these two. You think we're going to get a game about these two? You think we need their backstory and how they rose to power? Hope not, because it's actually explained later on in the game through echo logs and even then it's narratively brain dead. Our four new Vault Hunters are Zane Flint, the brother of Baron and Captain Flint, who is an experienced assassin. Amara, a new siren who is famous on her own planet and craves for a challenge, which is character I suppose. Moe's a fundamentally boring character that can summon a Titanfall ripoff to aid her. Why, why do people like playing her? And finally, Flack, who can summon and control beasts and canonically counts as non-binary representation but no one actually gives a wet fuck because he's a robot that is made of binary. This guy is fucking stupid! <laughs> The new Vault Hunters meet and kick some ass for a bit before hopping on the bus with Marcus, where Lilith begins to speak to them and welcomes them to the Crimson Raiders to their surprise. Wait, didn't Marcus say that they were answering a siren's call? But they clearly knew about the Crimson Raiders before because of the flyers, right? And why are they s surprised by Lilith? I don't know, just a small nitpick. It doesn't actually take away from the story. So despite a few bumps in the road, this seems like a decent opening. I can see things looking up from here. Oh god, he's Back. So as Clapped informs the new Vault Hunters that they've been ordered to infiltrate a COV propaganda center. So that means we have to be as stealthy as possible. So they quickly make work of the camp and are then confronted with the holy influencer of the COV, Shiv. He's a beloved member of the COV with a massive R and he's already dead. The Vault Hunters rescue Claptrap and Lilith comes down to greet them. She says that because she was so focused on finding the map that she didn't notice that Pandora was changing around her as the bandit clans united under the COV. So you didn't notice the massive banners unruly screeching from the psychos and a whole load of other shit because you were so focused on finding the map that's on the same planet as this was all happening on. You are such a fucking pancake. Did no one else notice this either? Fucking how? What about the B team being led by Brick, Mordecai, and Tina? Did they not report back to you seeing as how they've been fucking about in the middle of the desert for most of the time? Look at this sign. Does this look subtle to you? How did you let this happen? And furthermore, why have you not done much about it? Locked. 
Not gonna keep a siren out, though. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we call dialogue, and it's very well written. Lilith accesses a computer containing a message from Mouthpiece, who is the COV's m mouthpiece. Mouthpiece claims that the Sun Smasher clan have recovered the, and I quote, sacred vault map, and that they are to be accepted and banded under the COV immediately, meaning that Lilith and the Vault Hunters have to beat them to the Sun Smashers. I'm sorry, but what the hell do you mean sacred vault map? Did the COV know about the map the whole time? F fucking how? How the hell could they have possibly known about this map, and why are they calling it the sacred vault map? Is this what their entire goal has been? To gain a sacred vault map they shouldn't even know exists? Judging by the fact that the COV have only started to form over the last few years, and the map that was lost five years ago, and with the echo logs that we find from Tyrene and Troy on Necrotefeo, what a name by the way, we can tell that Tyrene and Troy only came to Pandora in the last few years as they were stuck on a necrophilia planet for most of their lives, so how could they have known about the map? From my knowledge, Hector only came to Sanctuary because he assumed they had it after defeating Jack. And if this map was really public knowledge to everyone on Pandora, then how in the blinky bill fuck has no one found it until now? It's been five years! How could the Sun Smashers have found it now? Were they always close to where it landed? Wow, this is really fucking silly! Especially when you consider the fact that according to the trailers... 10 billion followers demand we join or die. 10 billion. 10 fucking billion? You're telling me that many people on an entire planet haven't been able to find that key yet and that the COV has somehow had that sort of reach over the last five years and again, how have none of these fuck asses found the fucking map yet after five fucking years since it was fucking long? We're not even a quarter into the story yet and my brain is fried. Lilith and the Crimson Raiders take over the propaganda center and the Vault Hunters head over to the Sun Smasher camp. Apparently, the COV have completely trashed it and the Sun Smashers are nowhere to be found. Suddenly Vaughn. Vaughn was tied up and left to die by the Sun Smashers because he told them not to mess with the Vault Key, and we learned that the key has been successfully delivered to the Calypsos. I'm still incredibly depressed of how much Vaughn has devolved as a character and now acts as an annoying plank with the half the intelligence he originally had. I also hate how Borderlands' humour hasn't evolved from 2012, and as such there were barely any funny moments in this game and all attempts at humour felt like getting hit around the face with a wet sock. Borderlands 2 is still funny because despite the time period they were in, they still rolled with it and put effort into the right Tina, you know there are, like, other kinds of food, right? You haven't seriously been living on just crumpets for the last few years, have you? I do not understand the question. Here, however, they're trying so hard to recapture the feel of Borderlands' humour, they pretty much lost sight of what made the jokes in that game work, and think that toilet humour and memes were what made the game memorable. Oh, and on top of reusing one of the missions from the previous game, that's just really fucking lazy. So when Vaughn, a character that I used to like from Tales from the Borderlands, is introduced with a title card that adds a description, Bandit Life, as a way to try and make a catchphrase for marketing and then only have him say it like two times throughout the entire game, you begin to start wishing that Jack would just pop out of nowhere on Echo and start insulting you again. What? No. After Lilith and Vaughn reunite with as much enthusiasm as the sensation of watching paint dry, you head down to the Holy Broadcast Center to finally retrieve the map. Mouthpiece starts talking about live screams and Iridium tier chats and I, uh... What woefully out of touch grandma wrote this utter wank fest? Not even modern day Nickelodeon reaches this level of pure unadulterated cringe. How not even Logan fucking Paul is this much of a pandering fool. Fuck off. You confront Mouthpiece and take part in one of the best boss fights in the the game, which is really sad considering the rest of them, but not before you're treated to possibly one of the worst lines of dialogue I've ever heard. If I wanted to hear dialogue that is the equivalent of screeching diarrhea, I'd watch an episode of Game of Thrones after season 4. You cheese mouthpiece and acquire the vault key, but first the Calypso show up on hologram to tell you that the map is busted and to inform you that Tyreen's voice actress hasn't gotten into character yet and sounds like Mickey Mouse if he was high on ketamine. Oh, you missed the show! The Sun Smashers have also been killed for apparently betraying the COV by wanting guns and cash instead of being in the family. I'm still incredibly confused as to how you've managed to reach 10 billion people in the space of 5 years, but who knows, maybe psychos have a manipulation kink, who fucking, who knows. You take the map back to Lilith and she also realises that it's broken and can't be charged, so she sends you down to Tanis so she can examine and possibly fix it. While this happens, you and Lilith defend her camp from the COV, but first you have a minute of nothing happening while a few lines of code stand in a tent to pretend to work on something, because this game's story is exciting. Seriously, the mission objective tells you to loot the area and wait a minute, what the fuck? Tanis then informs you that Tyrene Calypso is a siren. Cool. She also tells you that she's after a vault. Cool. Okay, but seriously, that's literally like the setup for nearly every single game in this franchise. Tanis only partially fixes the map because 
sure. It reveals that the only planet can be made out on it is Promethea, which is apparently where the very first vault was found by Typhon de Leon, the first vault hunter. In every location in the game besides Sanctuary, you can find Typhon de Leon's recordings of his adventures. While it doesn't serve that much purpose other than finding some decent loot when you get all free in a certain area, it still allows you to get to know this character a fair bit before he's just randomly inserted into the story later on. Couldn't this have been a bit more obvious instead of putting it on the fucking challenge board? Because it actually allows me to get invested in this character and adds a bit of an impact later on. I know that I certainly went after all of these before finishing the area I was in, but that was because I was trying to go for 100% and had no idea this character would ever be mentioned again. Why not make this an optional mission to go for? Because I can tell you now that most players had no fucking clue this was a thing. You throw story important stuff like this to the side, but give delivering burgers its own official side mission. Are you fucking kidding me? Lilith tells you to, ah, uh, that, that's literally all she does in this game, tells you to head down to the ship they're building called Sanctuary f all I need is some fuel Wait, no, oh, come, come on, oh, come on, no! After you do that, the site is suddenly attacked by, okay, okay yeah, yeah, thanks, Claptrap. The site is suddenly attacked by Tyrene and Troy. For some reason, Lilith is still holding the vault key, like, why, why, why would you not leave it inside? This precious alien artifact that you've been searching for the past five years? Why Why would you not leave it inside where it's safe? Are, are you fucking stupid? We get a terrible cutscene that tries to be intense, but because cutscenes are hard to animate, we get really slow, weightless movements and actions that shouldn't have the impact they do have. I will now give you a recreation of my reaction to seeing this for the first time. We find out that Troy is also a siren, S sort of. Apparently him and Tyrene being twins means they were both given siren powers, but because whatever higher being or whatever that chooses who gets siren powers is sexist, she's the one who gets the true power and Troy only acts as a parasite who can use his sister's powers but has to leech off of her to live. You know, just because we needed more questions as to what the fuck sirens are, but sure. Why do only females get to be sirens? Like, I'm not even being a sexist prick, like I'm just genuinely confused as to why. What? Oh. <laughs> Okay, okay, what chooses who gets siren powers? And how? Is it completely random, or I, I I have no idea what the fuck is happening here? Only six sirens can exist at the same time, right? So does Troy count as one of the six despite not being a siren? He has the same powers as his sister, so I hope not. Wait, so what happens if Tyrene's leech powers were to leech and take the powers of a siren? Wouldn't that fuck up the whole- uh... Tyrene appears behind Lilith. Lilith looks at her for a full second and then gets grabbed and held up in the air while she drains Lilith's powers, no longer making her a siren and removing her of her firehawk status. You looked at her for a second and did nothing, you infantile rooster. This isn't the last time she does this, by the way. Lilith is just a fucking potato in this game. The Calypso stream Lilith's apparent death to their fans without actually killing her for some reason before leaving her to be killed by the bandits they dropped in using Lilith's powers. What the fuck? You're telling me that Lilith's powers can just teleport any random bastard from any location on Pandora, yet in the past you could only teleport people that were around her or holding her hand. This could have solved a fuckload of problems and also how does it work? Do you see whoever you're trying to teleport or something or does... So you save Lilith and jump on Sanctuary and finally head out into space. We get a nice little tribute to Scooter after his death and Tales from the Borderlands that add more of an impact than anything that happens later on in this game. I will get to this later. Lilith and the main protagonists, excluding you because in this game you don't exist in cutscenes anymore, again I will get to this later, decide that they should keep pursuing the vaults. Ellie turns around and says that the ship needs a name, and then Lilith turns around and says she already has a name. Sanctuary. Which would be an okay line if it wasn't for the fact that during this scene, Ellie is standing behind a massive fuck off sign for the ship that says Sanctuary on it, making the line utterly retarded. So everyone decides to continue and head straight for Promethea, the home of the Atlas Corporation, which is now under attack from Malawan, who are apparently allied with the COV. Fucking where? What? When? Who? Why? Okay, who thought getting involved with Malawan was a good idea exactly? What if your quest for power made them instantly turn a 
against you. You don't have an entire corporation on your hands, you fucking retards. That was just a good idea. When did this happen? And furthermore, where did this happen? How could you have possibly been able to contact Malawan to get this done? You're essentially one massive bandit clan on Pandora. Was it the fact that Tyrene and Troy are sirens or... Okay, okay, why did this happen? You can see that Malawan are trying to fight a war with Atlas. Why would they then get involved with some other bullshit from two hot topic hot sauce motherfuckers that started a massive fuck off cult? And finally, what? As in what the fuck? I mean, I guess it stays consistent with each of the games centering around one of the weapon manufacturers doing a bit of an oopsie, but it feels like Malawan randomly being shoehorned into the story rather than having it actually make sense. You arrive in Promethea and someone on Echo starts saying that there are bandits coming out of thin air. So I guess there's not going to be an explanation to this insanely overpowered ability that Lilith has seemingly never used, so that's fine. I'm sure of that. Hey, does anyone remember when Lilith got tired out from using her powers and struggled to control them without the assistance of Iridium? Yet Tyrene is somehow able to muster up enough strength to teleport her entire fucking army of bandits to new planets. Why are there no established rules and sirens, you impotent enchiladas? Why can Lilith be list limp dicked in terms of power, yet Tyrene has no problem with it? We continue to kill bandits for a bit before spotting a woman named Lorelei. Lorelei is trying to help Atlas win the war against Malawan and needs your help in taking back territory. She also sounds annoying when trying to convey any sort of emotion other than dead silence. How the fuck am I able to tolerate Claptrap more than this? She then asked the Vault Hunter if you were sent by Reese, and Zane probably has the single greatest response to this. Oh, right. I'm Lorelei. Did Reese send you? Reese? No clue, sorry. By Reese, she is of course referring to Reese from Tales from the Borderlands, because you can't just have Vaughn and leave Reese out. And he has apparently built Atlas back up over the last five years after becoming CEO at the end of Tales. While it's good to see Reese again, I feel like this game has completely fucking forgotten what happened at the end of that game, because there were still no answers as to what happened to Reese and Fiona at the end of Chapter 5, or where Fiona even is for that matter. Why? Why would you just skim over that when it was the biggest question on people's minds, you fucking crumpets. Why, if you were going to connect these two together, would you not add some of the biggest questions, you fucking wankers? There is so much you could do to explain this, but because writing is difficult, there were probably some corners cut or something. I don't know what happened here. Fucking... Randy Pitchford and his magic tricks. How the fuck did we go from one of the best video game stories ever told to a story that is bleeding errors out of its arsehole every time it breathes? Why would you put more manpower into cutscenes if you aren't going to bother with the goddamn story? What was the fucking point? We are now at a point where side missions are more akin to Borderlands 2's writing than the actual story. Fucking kill me. So Lorelei asks for help in recapturing an Atlas base that was captured by Malawan a few months ago. And you take it down no sweat and it would be cool if Lorelei I could do it with you, seeing as how she takes no fucking damage. So you finally manage to contact Reed. Lorelai has a fit over his new mustache, which I think was supposed to be humour, and he tells you to go meet up with his top agent to take down Megamind. I'm sorry, Gigamind. This agent is, of course, Zero, a friend to Reese and Tales from the Borderlands, and one of the Vault Hunters who took down Handsome Jack in Borderlands 2. Unfortunately, Zero and Maya are all you're guessing for the Borderlands 2 Vault Hunters in this game, as none of them are anywhere to be found in this game. No Axton, no Salvador, no Krieg, and no game. Age. What the fuck are you doing? Why the fuck would you give the Vault Hunters from the first game their own characters and personalities while also developing them and expanding on them in Borderlands 2? But then when it comes down to Borderlands 2's own Vault Hunters, you just shove them aside. What the fuck? You, you think people might want to know what happened to these guys? Oh no, I lied. Apparently there's an Echo series of Krieg slowly getting back his sanity and one Echo randomly placed around Promethea that confirms that Gage is still alive. The continuing stories of the previous Vault hunters are thrown aside from the actual story and are things that you'll probably find a complete fucking accident on your first playthrough. And even then, they're incredibly piss poor. Krieg Swan can get some sort of pass, but Gage doesn't even speak. She just gets mentioned by the dickhead who put the bounty on her head. And Axton and Salvador get completely thrown aside as there isn't even a mere mention of them anywhere. This is how you treat these characters? That is fucking quality. So Zero and the Vault Hunters attack some Malawan troops. Apparently Zero and Zane went to the same assassin school, but that's their elaborated on because fuck potential am I right? You find a depot and get Zero an upgrade to his sword that allows him to cut through Malawan barriers, but you're then contacted by Katagawa who is the head of Malawan acquisitions who offers Zero the chance to join Malawan and says that you mean nothing to him and that you'll be dealt with later because every time someone has done that in this franchise it's gone so fucking well.
you and Zero go and kill Gigamind and obtain some key information, while also blackmailing Reese into helping you open the vault on Promethea, leading to him saying that his hologram has feelings, which I think was supposed to be humor. Searching through Gigamind's brain- wait, wait, what? Ha hang on, how can you scan a brain for information? I get a little suspension of disbelief is stretched rather thin in this franchise, but I find it quite ridiculous that you can get troop movements, supply lines, information on Malawan's search for the vault key, and that they're attacking your Venus through scanning a physical thing. Oh yeah, and the next planet in the game is a Venus, the previously mentioned home of fan favorite Borderlands 2 character Maya. So you set a course for a Venus, and Malawan are already there, which just fuck me. A Venus is currently under attack for the possession of a vault key fragment for the vault in Promethea, and seeing as how they're all peaceful monks, they're basically fucking defenseless. So you help them out for a bit, and then you find Maya, who's used for like two hours in this game. Why? You're then contacted by Captain Crunch, who sounds incredibly enthusiastic to advertise his new cereal boxes and also wants to kill every monk on a Venus because he's a pain in the dick, and that's his character. Are there like any new characters in this game that are even slightly entertaining? Oh fuck, speaking of which, Maya says that you need to check on her new apprentice to make sure that she's alive and well. Can I just say that a Venus is probably the most disappointing area in the entire game? It gets used like once in the entire campaign, it has like one area, whereas Pandora, Promethea, Eden 6 and the Mayo planet have close to 10 each. Which sucks because this is generally one of the best looking areas in the entire game and it's designed really well, yet it's used like one time. And speaking of crippling disappointment, you're randomly thrust into a cutscene where you're then introduced to this miserable pile of twat that the game insists on calling Ava, but for the sake of this assessment her name shall be Prick until I deem it necessary to call her by her actual name. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us- Prick is Maya's apprentice, and you've been asked to collect Iridium from Maya to use later on, and I'm sorry, but again with the fucking Iridium. Why are some sirens only able to increase their power when low with Iridium, like Lilith, but Maya apparently never needs it, and only needs it to basically go Super Saiyan? This is also a problem with the Borderlands 2 audio logs that delve into info on Maya, but there are some serious fumble chunks in charge of siren coherency. How were they connected to the Iridians? Why are they connected to the Iridians? What fucking purpose do they serve? To be powerful because? That Tron guy is the worst and I want to kick his dick off my- Shuts the fuck up, prick. All I ever do is protect archives or storerooms or sacred whatever- Fuck off, prick. Stop fucking talking to me and let me play the damn game. Captain Crunch appears out of thin air after the most weirdly paced intro cutscene in the entire franchise. He gets built up throughout the whole entire section on Athenus and he's just dropped in with no snarky remark at all, but hey, it's certainly better than whatever the fuck mouthpiece's introduction was. Captain Crunch tries to advertise his new cereal to you, but you reply with a no you and send him into fucking orbit, reminding him that Cheerios are all you need for a decent breakfast. You hand the Iridium over to Maya, who says that there's a technique in the book that allows her to open this Iridian gate. You find the first vault key fragment inside, notify Lilith on Sanctuary, who tells you to give it over to Tannis, but not before something truly magical happens. Maya tells you that the real reason she picked Prick to be her apprentice is because she's going to be a fucking siren one day. What the fuck is going on in this hemorrhoidic troglodyte infested fuckland you call a universe? Why the fuck is Prick going to be a siren? How is she going to be a siren? How can you tell that she's going to be a siren? You fucking- Who the fuck wrote this? <laughs> the fuck is this dumb shit? Only six sirens can exist at the same time, meaning that there is literally no way to tell if Prick will ever become a siren. Like what, can you sense it? Fucking how? In fact, how can there be six sirens at the same time? Sirens have obviously died before, so are people just born sirens and given the powers randomly? That sounds incredibly fucking stupid, please don't let that be the case- OH FUCK YOU! You head back to Sanctuary with Maya and Prick the prickled cactus a fuck- I'm sorry, I'm not done with this, how the fuck can you tell that she is a siren? Is this game seriously that sexually confused, are you fucking with my soul? So you give Tannis the vault key and she says that touching the fragment makes her skin crawl, along with the fact that she ate one of Marcus's burritos, which I think was supposed to be humour. Tannis tells you to check with Maya and Lilith and that she's antisocial, which I also think was supposed to be humour. You find Maya talking to Lilith about the eventuality of Prick becoming a siren and 
Fuck me. Can't explain it right now, Lilith. You can't explain it. We'll talk about this later. You'll talk about it later? God, you feckless fucking dildos. How can you not explain it? And why would you not want to talk about it? Just who had an aneurysm on the writing team for this game? What the fuck is happening? Back onto the story. Your next objective is to help out Reese as Katagawa's got a laser cannon aimed at Atlas HQ that's being powered by a vault key fragment. So a cannon is being powered by a key fragment. What are you talking about? about Willis. How can a key fragment- Fuck this, you guys know what it's a shit. So you and Reese team up and head to Skywell for one of the most boring, tedious missions in the game where you go to disable the cannon and retrieve the vault key fragment. I'm just going to skip over this entire chunk for the most part because it's basically a whole hour of killing shit and I may or may not be bitter about my game crashing after defeating Katagawa Ball and me losing all of that progress on my first legendary. I guess that's what I get for purchasing the game on launch day on the fucking Epic Store. So as I was saying, you and Reese fire the cannon at Katagawa's ship and destroy the Katagawa ball he uses to try and kill you and obtain the Vault Key Fragment. Reese then reveals that he's had the final fragment in Atlas HQ the entire fucking time. Yes, thank you for keeping it from us, you fucking bell sniff. So you head down to Atlas HQ and... And I am not fucking kidding. Malawan somehow breaches into the courtyard right after Reese boasts the Katagawa that they can't get past him. So they then just decide to shoot the defense center once and they're just allowed to get through. Fucking awful. Why the fuck does their defense center not have protection or a shield on it, you miserable cunt? And furthermore, why are there no defenses on the defense center on Atlas HQ? What the fuck? That's arguably the one place you would want to have shields on and Malawan can just shoot straight at it even though the cannon they had was deactivated. What was the point in that cannon if they can just shoot and destroy a defense center in literal seconds? Someone actually wrote this. Oh, and apparently Zero has turned to Malawan all of a sudden and is killing Atlas soldiers. I wonder if this incredibly out-of-character choice is a setup of some kind. Zero comes in and reveals the fake Zero as Katagawa and you kill him in one of the best boss fights in the game, which is considered a thing by some people, even though it fucking isn't, seriously, how- how- it's just- it takes- so- what- what- fuck- Katagawa fucking explodes and Reese finally gives you the vault key fragment. You are then prompted to comment on Reese's mustache with two choices and whichever one you choose will result in a message in reference to Tales from the Borderlands to appear, which just makes me wish I was playing through that game's story instead. You then find out that the vault is hidden in the middle of Promethea and that Atlas just paved over it, which makes absolutely zero sense. Why would Atlas not want to open the vault themselves? What was stopping them from doing so? Why weren't they searching for the vault keys themselves? Literally untold alien treasure lies in the middle of the planet and a massive fuck off corporation just paved over it. Fucking keck. Prick decides to ask to come along with Maya and the vault hunter and is then told to stay on Sanctuary on the bridge with Lilith. So that means she's going to find some way to sneak down with you and watch you kill the vault monster because her character is well written, guys. Seriously? What have I been training for? Shut the fuck up, prick. You and Maya go down and kick the asses of the COV who are attempting to stop you from opening the vault, whilst Tyrene and Troy make childish jokes in your ear because the writers seem to have forgot what made Handsome Jack's taunting actually entertaining, and all it does is make me contemplate my own existence. This story has the consistency of pigeon shit. No, fuck it, we're not going to think about it, let's just get on with the story the way we're supposed to, it's fine. If by supposed to you mean by not using your brain, then yes, the only way to find this story mildly entertaining is by turning your brain off like the writers clearly did. The vault is yours for the taking, but not before you and Maya face off against the vault monster or whatever this thing is supposed to be. Because it honestly just looks like they ran out of ideas on what to design the vault monsters as we get this animal shaped ball of squashed tentacle porn that the game refers to as the rampager. And he's piss easy. W what else did you expect from a vault monster that isn't the final boss? Suddenly Prick. Yes, Prick being the well balanced and tolerable character that she is, left Sanctuary to go and watch you kill the vault monster, and understandably Maya is is pissed off of the impatient little shit, and I'm pissed off too, because how the fuck did she leave Sanctuary without anyone noticing? She was told to stay with Lilith on the bridge, how could she have left without anyone fucking noticing? And if they did notice, how would they not be fucking notifying Maya about this? Did she use the fast travel, or did she just use the drop pod, and in each case, how the fuck did she manage to get where we're at? Okay, so here's a logical breakdown of the fantastical witchcraft that Prick 
needed to pull off to get here. She would have had to sneak past Lilith and everyone on the bridge, either use the fast travel or the drop pod to get down to Promethea, get past Mallow on forces and the CFV that remain, walk all the fucking way across this incredibly dangerous terrain, venture into the subway, sneak into the Iridian cave and somehow sit back and watch Maya and the Vault Hunter 69 the Vault Monster. What in the shitting universe is going on? How in the pickled fuck could she have done that? Are you fucking with my soul? And sorry, I'm not done with this yet. How the fuck is this walking vagina predicted to be a siren and what tells you that she will become one? There is no way in bloody hell that you can explain that to me and tell me that she's- Ah, yes, you can't explain it, can you? You just think she'll be a siren- because. You don't even know anything about your mere existence, what sirens even are, the connections to the Iridians, or any of that juicy shit that would have been really good fucking world building, but no. Just give us more questions and answers on how a normal teenage girl can become a siren. Fucking awful. This is what happens when you introduce a mystically powered character in your first game and don't bother with planning where it may go, this shit is embarrassing. While Maya and Prick argue, you're permitted to enter the vault. The first time in any Borderlands game where you can actually enter a vault and collect things for yourself. Ancient alien treasures await that will excite and be a perfect opportunity to show the best of this game's random weapon generation. Inside the vault you find four chests containing mostly green and blue rarity weapons with the one purple in one chest and nothing else. Wow. Way to kill all of the fucking anticipation, guys. You cannot, I repeat, cannot build up the treasure of the vaults for this fucking long and then bitch slap the player with average to decent weapons and nothing else. You actual fuckers. Even if you didn't have the courage to give us better weapons, why not give us some more fucking iridium and cash? Maybe that would make it slightly worth it. Who the fuck was the complete and utter pineapple in charge of making the vaults as underwhelming as possible? Oh, and that's not the best part, check this shit out. Tanis starts using a fucking siren ability to contact you and tries to disguise it as a communication device. Who the fuck wrote this utter garbage? This will be brought up later in the game and I will rip into it once we get there, but for now all I'll say is fuck you, you bruised eggplant, stop killing every decent part of this world. Oh and you find out inside the vault that there's something connecting it to another vault that's on even 6 because apparently every location is tied to each in this game, what the fuck. Why are there other vault locations inside of a fucking vault? You leave the vault and walk straight into a cutscene where Maya and Prick argue for a bit before Tyreen and Troy show up out of nowhere and begin to suck the life out of the vault monster, revealing that the vault monsters are actually the power of the vaults themselves, which... Sure. And that they make both Tyreen and Troy stronger. Troy asks for Tyreen to stop sucking and to give him the suck in return, and she does what is quite possibly the most pointless use of Lilith's power I have ever seen. She just teleports a meter away from her position to touch Troy. Someone actually wrote this. Apparently, power can be transferred from Siren to human, but I will get into this later. We should be kicking their ass! Shut the fuck up, prick. I'm gonna be a Siren, and then I'm gonna mop the floor with asshole- Fuck off, prick. Every time you open your mouth, I feel like contemplating my own existence. Just please shut up. Tyreen once again makes a complete and utter waste of Lilith's powers by teleporting a meter away from where she is standing to try and heroically put prick out of her misery to save us from ever hearing her speak again. But Maya, being the only good character in this story grabs Troy and tells Tyreen to put Prick down and she sadly complies. And then some something happens. Some something really cool happens. Troy grabs Maya's arm and begins to drain her power by using Tyreen's leech powers. And not at once, the entire time, does Maya think that it would be a good idea to let go of Troy and push him aside and let him drain her. Maya tells Prick to be ready and then she fucking disintegrates, with Troy now being able to use her powers. Maya is fucking dead. Troy then explains that he didn't need to leech off Tyreen as he can apparently just leech off of any siren, because fuck you. They both decide to fuck off and leave Prick alone as she mourns over Maya's burnt remains. What in the holy mother of fucking Papega did I just witness? This entire scene was written by a chimp with schizophrenia and I genuinely feel insulted from watching it happen. Let's break this down piece by piece. In the previous games, while the Vault Hunters were never in the cutscenes, the characters in them would still act like you were actually there and would actually talk to you and reference you. Hell, later in the game, Troy phase locks the Vault Hunters into a cutscene and directly talks to them. Yet we still don't see them here. So you would think this game would bear some sort of 
fucking consistency when it comes to the goddamn cutscenes, but here's what happens canonically. The Vault Hunters walk out of the vault and into a cutscene where Tyrene and Troy appear out of nowhere, begin taking the power of the Vault Monster, start choking out Prick and kill Maya. Yet there is literally no acknowledgement that they even exist at all or are even watching this happen. Yet the in-game story after this cutscene acts like they were there the entire time and just didn't do anything. Fucking awful. Would it fucking kill any of you to actually animate the Vault Hunters into the damned story? Considering the fact that this is the most story sensitive game in the entire franchise so far. And how you have the Vault Hunters interact and talk to the characters in game with their own unique voice lines. The pre-sequel already did this and had different voice prompts for the Vault Hunters so why not go a step further and add them into the fucking scene? We know that the one Vault Hunter that you pick in single player isn't the only one that canonically saves the day at the end because Lilith, Mordecai, Brick and Rose Roland, rest in peace, were the ones known for slaying the Destroyer in Borderlands 1, even if you did only play Lilith in single player. And we also know that Zero, Axed, Engage, Salvador, Maya, and Creek were the ones to defeat Handsome Jack and the Warrior. So canonically, Zane, Amara, Flack, and Moe's just defeated the Rampager and looted the Vault, stood completely still while no one acknowledged their existence, didn't do anything to stop the Calypso Twins from leeching the Rampager and killing Maya, and let them leave, only to comfort Prick right after and telling her that they need to go. What the fuck, you complete and utter blunderbusses. Treat your goddamn story with some fucking respect for once. Why would you not show the Calypsos taking down the Vault Hunters if you really wanted Maya to be killed off like that? Secondly, I understand the type of character you were going for when writing her, but Jesus fucking Christ. Prick might just be the worst character in the entire franchise. All she does is blame other people for her own fuck-ups like the utter galompus she fucking is. Is always whining and complaining about shit without taking a fucking hint that no one wants her in harm's way, and has a voice so annoying that it would make someone want to massacre a herd of gorillas. Fucking Pickle had a larger and more positive impact on the entire story. I will be elaborating on more of Prick's monumental fuck-ups in a few minutes and later on, because I really can't do it justice when I'm not even halfway into the story yet. Yes, we're not even halfway. Thirdly, Maya. What the fuck was this bucket of wank? What is the point in bringing back established characters, have them do things in the story, and then kill them off in the most insulting way possible. This entire scene was a massive middle finger to every person who mained Maya in Borderlands 2, and adds to them not giving a single fuck about any of Borderlands 2's Vault Hunters besides Zero, who was again used like two times in the actual story. Seriously, Troy touches Maya, he leeches her, and Maya still doesn't let go of him. How are you going to tell me that this was supposed to be an emotional moment? The only emotions I felt were confusion and rage during this entire scene. Prick gets Maya killed because of her sheer fucking Competence and Maya gets killed because the writers forgot that she was one of the few characters in the damn story with some common sense. That's also a running theme in this game, the deaths have literally zero emotional impact at all. What made Roland's death in Borderlands 2 work was that it was an established character that got built on in Borderlands 2, who we actually got to know and was killed to fulfil a fucking purpose that made sense for the story and was killed by a villain who had a way to kill him that made sense that didn't highlight Roland's stupidity, as well as a reason to actually kill him. It was a fantastic subversion of expectations and made you actually want to defeat Jack. And while the audio logs in Borderlands 2 flesh Maya's character out a bit more, and she's a fan favourite character in the community, the way she's killed off is done without grace or emotional tension. The way she dies makes literally no fucking sense, her death is caused by the stupidity of a character that we already hate, that the game wants us to like and root for, her death highlights her own stupidity and lack of common sense because it was taken away from her to make the scene happen, and generally acts like a big fuck you to anyone who liked her character. Not to mention how Troy doesn't make good use of Maya's powers at all, making her death even more frustrating. He only uses Maya's powers a handful of times and every time it's done it's used in the most pathetic way possible, and only exists to give Prick the excuse to become a siren later on in the game. Yeah, sorry, I'm not done with this. Why is this the character that gets to be a siren? All she has done is make the entire story miserable so far. She caused the death of a beloved character, blames it on anyone but herself and she is never punished or taught the error of her ways. She is the same character throughout the entire story from the moment you meet her on Athenus to when Pandora is finally saved. Good fucking lord, this is such a mess. And I'm also not done on Maya's death by the way, how the fuck is this good writing in the slightest? Troy can apparently just take the life force and power of any siren and doesn't have to take from Tyrene, meaning that he had no idea that it could work if he started touching Maya to take her powers. And when Tyrene questions this, his only response can be summed up as, 
It just works. Fuck off and burn with that shit, you anorexic fuck. And can someone explain to me why the vaults are so underwhelming again? Fuck this story. You return with Prick to Sanctuary, where everyone, including Zero, Tennis, Lilith, Prick, Ellie, and Moxie, are standing around and paying their respects to Maya. And Lilith says that there was literally nothing that you could do. Oh, fuck off and shut up with that horse shit. We literally just stood back and watched it happen. Fuck you. Lilith struggles to get her words out, so Tennis thinks it's a good time to speak up now, and we get her special tribute towards Maya. I knew Maya when she was alive. I preferred her that way. That didn't come out right. Oh, shut up, you cockalorous pillock. Why the hell do we get a comedic eulogy for a character you just killed off who so many people love? If killing Maya off in the dumbest way possible wasn't enough of a fuck you, this entire scene acts like a bitch slap to anyone who ever liked her. Don't ask me to speak at your funeral, Lilith. No one fucking asked you, Tannis. You spoke up on your own accord, you complete and utter ninny hammer. Can you treat your fucking dialogue with respect at least for God's sake! Lilith immediately tells everyone they're going to continue going after the vaults to make Maya's death mean anything, and everyone goes away to continue doing whatever it is they were doing. Right, so we get absolutely no reaction from any of our member of the Crimson Raiders who is in this circle. What the fuck does Zero think of the death of his friend and fellow vault hunter who helped him and the others take down Handsome Jack in Borderlands 2? Did his VA take a day off, or did you legitimately not have anything for him to say regarding the death of a close friend? And just when you thought no more bombs could drop on this utter turd fest, Prick starts talking again. And this time, she's blaming Lilith for Maya's death. Excuse me, what the fuck? The only reason Maya is dead is because of you being a disobedient child, you feckless cretin. And now you want to take it out on Lilith. You don't want to think about how your own actions cause Maya's death. You don't want to think about how going after the vaults is stopping the Calypsos from getting more powerful. No, just blame it on Lilith. Cool, I hate it. Oh, and Prick says that Maya said Vault Hunters run towards the fire, which fuck me, what do you think we're even doing here? We are literally trying to stop the fucking Calypsos and we can't just run towards them because they now have free siren abilities, which is again because of your own blatant stupidity. And the worst part about all of this is that the game doesn't try to paint this as Prick being immature as Lilith is genuinely affected by this, making it out like Prick is in the right here and Lilith is doing the wrong thing when in reality it's the other way around. Are you fucking with my soul? What a great scene. Just die. So you set a course for Eden 6 and tried to call Sir Hammerlock, but instead Hammerlock's boyfriend, Wainwright Jacobs, picks up to tell you that the COV have kidnapped him because of fucking course they have. They're just on the planet already. It literally has been an hour since we defeated the Rampager. And they're already on Eden 6. Just fuck this story. You arrive on Eden 6 and Wainwright Jacobs, now the CEO, well, not the CEO, but I'm getting into that in a second, of the Jacobs Corporation contacts you on the Echo and asks for help, and that the Calypso has murdered his father and are coming for hit. How have they done this already? Just f Fine. You save Wainwright's life and discuss how the COV are literal time wizards who have killed his father and kidnapped Hammerlock in the span of who fucking knows at this point, and that Hammerlock is being held in a prison called the Anvil, and that Wainwright has already sent a team of mercenaries to go and rescue him but have heard nothing from them yet, and promises to get you the Eden 6 vault key if you break Hammerlock out. He tells you to meet up with the team's muscle known as Meat Slab. Oh wow, I wonder who that could be. Oh hi Brick. You and Brick clean up some COV, Brick starts calling the COV scrubs, which I think was supposed to be humor, and he tells you to meet up with... I did my lesson is Right, I, I, we're supposed to be using code names. Crook Bunny needs your help. Ha ha, game. Oh, and there's also someone called Birdman. And ha ha, game. You're not very clever. Crunk Bunny is a damn prodigy with explosives. Okay, seriously, game. We all know it's Tina, for God's sake. Just show Anne. There she is. Tina tells you in her own trademark way that some bandit took her bomb to break Hammerlock out of prison. That you need to get her the parts to make a new one. Well, it's definitely great to see Brick, Tina, and Mordecai again. Watching Tina's model appear mostly static with a few movements. Whilst Ashley Birch voice acts her heart out, it's kind, it's kind of awkward. Hey, look, here's the deal. They're keeping Hammy Locks in max security, and there's a big old door, and he's blowing up. But, uh, but shit's got complicated, and some bandits took my bomb! Still, I could probably say that Tina's dialogue is one of the few entertaining parts of this game's story, even if she is only used, like, three times throughout the whole of the game's missions. Like, seriously, what? Oh!
You break into the prison, beat the warden, and save Hammerlock. Again, another highlight, because Michael Tatum's voice work is always a plus, but it's short-lived as you find out that the person who sold out Hammerlock to the Calypsos is, and I am not fucking kidding, this is actually a thing, is Aurelia fucking Hammerlock. Hammerlock's sister. So now you're going to completely gloss over her entire arc from the pre-sequel. That, that, that's what you did with that. That's just fucking quality, isn't it? Jesus Christ, you galactic muppets! So now Aurelia is the big bad of Eden 6 that you have to deal with. And considering this game's terrible track record when it comes to respecting its established characters, I could predict that you will eventually kill her and completely undermine her arc in the pre-sequel. Uh... Now Aurelia begins speaking to you on the Echo and you have to endure the 30 minutes of eardrum torture porn that she has recorded for you. Oh, and when you see Alistair, tell him I'm rich. Stop making me endure this cringe fest, you frosty twit. You completely changed your entire character for no fucking reason other than hating your brother. I hate this story. You head off to Jacob's Manor in order to find a clue to where the vault key could be. Do you think I might be going a little fast for this part of the game? That's because Eden 6 takes up a ludicrous amount of the game's playtime, whereas planets with actual promise, like Athenus, have about half an hour. F fucking stunning. And that's especially bad because while I do actually like Eden 6 as an area, it's probably the most graphically intense part of the game with all the details in it, causing my frame rate to often shit the bed. I can literally smell my graphics card catching fire trying to render some of this, and I was playing on medium graphic settings by the way, with like middle ground requirements in order to actually play the game. Wainwright sneaks into Jacob's Manor to try and find a clue to where the vault key could be hiding, and you go up to negotiate with Aurelia. Suddenly Troy! Yeah, big shocker, but Aurelia sold you out to Troy and he phase locks you and monologues to you. I find it so amazing that this game's story and cutscenes keep finding new ways to be mind-numbingly inconsistent. Why do the Vault Hunters exist in this cutscene, but not in this one? Why do all of the Borderlands games refer to you as the Vault Hunter when canonically there are usually about four of them that save the day? How fucking stupid. If I'm being perfectly honest, this monologue actually gives some much needed depth to Troy's character. If it was just written a little better and stayed consistent throughout the entire game, then this would have been some pretty decent character development for him, with him feeling like he's always in Tyreen's shadow and that everyone just orbits around her. How he wants and desires to be so much more than he actually is. But before he's about to kill you, Wayne Wright shows up and shoots him straight in the stomach, and he's apparently fine. Can Sirens just heal? Or I I, I don't know at this point, but Troy gets distracted and runs after Wayne Wright while you clean out the manor of COV. Troy then decides to show you something that Maya had the ability to do, apparently, and creates an anointed bandit with the single worst character card in the franchise. I'm not too sure if phase locking and everything else Maya is capable of was ever capable of turning people into purple monsters who put the pace of the game to a screeching halt, but fine, cool, guess you could always do that. WHO WROTE THIS? Now you have to do this stupid puzzle on this stage that allows you to enter this private study, and you find a record left by Wainwright's father that could contain a clue to where the vault key lies, because apparently he had time to record and put it on a record player before he died. You know, this is taken when he knows that they're coming after him. Fucking what? The fuck? What the fuck? You're then told to start a Jacob's Resistance, because apparently playtime is short in this area, to take back Eden 6. So you head down to a town called Reliance and meet Killmonger and do this entire mission for a while that I'm actually going to skip over, as literally nothing happens here. But hey, Wainwright's got the record working, and there are three locations to go to to get the key fragments. And I would just like to remind everyone again that we are still in Eden 6. The first location is a ship called the Family Jewel and you're told to come find the ship's navigator, Balex, who's played by Ice-T. I-I'm not joking, by the way. And he probably has some of the only funny lines in the entire campaign, so it probably works out, I don't know. Almost there, but I I'm kinda in the middle of something. And that something is a big fucking dinosaur! Heads up! Apparently, Balex and the combat pilot, Genevieve, got into an argument and she put his AI inside of a teddy bear. So now she's the bad guy that you have to get rid of. And her boss is also a complete piece of piss, but contains the funniest moment in the entire game, so I, it works out, I think. You're not designed to solve problems, Balex. That's my job. You're just my chauffeur. Well, what I'm solving is the anti-collision safeguards, which I just turned off. Navigate it, bitches! <laughs> You require the first vault key fragment and head back to Sanctuary where all of a sudden Genevieve is just here and trying to take over the, the ship. What the fuck is going on exactly? Where have the stakes been this entire time? There is literally nothing happening throughout this entire segment and then all of a sudden, boom, this AI that shouldn't even be with you is just here. 
epic. Genevieve gets ejected out by Balex, and Jesus Christ, when did this story get so fucking boring? I've been recapping what's happening and not actually doing anything. That's just how nothing Eden 6 actually is. Sure, it's fun to play, but the story just comes to a screeching halt here. So if you don't mind me, I'ma just skip all the way to the point where it picks up and see if it gets any better. You find the last fragment in a fucking barrel and kill Aurelia because she shot her brother and tries to kill you. <coughs> What the fuck are you doing? Why, when the story picks up, am I treated to the purest definition of shit fuck? The key fragment in the barrel I can probably get behind, even though I find that ridiculous, but what the fuck were the writers smoking when putting Aurelia in this game? Her entire arc in the pre-sequel has been completely snuffed from canon, now she's just a one-dimensional prick. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about the other one. <laughs> no! The treatment of established characters in this campaign had to have been done while the writing team was completely baked. You cannot tell me that these people gave a wet shit about the continuity of the previous games whatsoever. Why the unholy wank is Aurelia featured next to Wainwright and Hammerlock in the trailer, as if to bait people into thinking that this game is going to tie up every story from the previous games and have them working side by side, only to then slap her into the game as a cartoon bad guy. Fuck this story. Why do some decisions feel like they never played the previous games, but then have missions later on in the story that show a decent understanding of them? I have never seen a story so confused with its own sexuality in my entire life. So you unfortunately put Aurelia out of her misery, and Hammerlock and Wainwright ask if they're alright, and that Wainwright was apparently shot, but only Hammerlock was shot in the previous cutscene, so fucking whatever. To reveal the entrance to the vault, you have to solve a puzzle out in the Jacob's Garden, and you know, considering how in-depth this is, I have to ask how this was even done, but questions are for fucking dweebs, I guess. Anyway, you find the entrance to the vault and meet up with Tannis, who's just... there. I, I don't get it, what? Why is there a fast travel here anyway? And yes, I'm considering gameplay mechanics as an issue for the story, because they are visibly used in the bloody story. Did the Iridians ever use fast travel? I don't know anything at this point. Tannis, there have always been guardians protecting the fucking vaults. I'm fairly certain you know this, you dopey tit. After fighting the second worst boss in the entire game, seriously, why does this take so long? Tannis uses some new technology to stop the Calypsos from leeching the vault monster when she's very visibly using siren powers. I will get onto this soon, just wait. The vaults are as disappointing as last time, and you head out to talk to Tannis, but then, and I am not fucking kidding you, this actually happens. She is suddenly phase-locked and teleported away by the Calypso- What the fuck are you people doing, you insufferable twats? Are sirens just able to use their powers from whatever fucking distance, no matter what? What the fuck? How did the Calypsos fucking do this? How did they use both Maya and Lilith's powers to kidnap Tannis from across the fucking stars and all the way to Pandora, you dull dishwashers? Can you make sure your story makes a lick of sense at the bloody least? If this has always been possible, then is there a way for sirens to see through time and space to phase lock some random dickhead or teleport them to an undisclosed location? How does that make any sense? whatsoever. Who thought that this was the way to go about the story? Just have the Calypso show up and take Tannis with them, for God's sake. Have them show up and take Tannis away themselves. It is not hard. It is called writing a believable method of kidnapping to progress your shit out of a campaign, you undercooked muffins. Understandably, everyone is sent into a frenzy. Prick begins to shit talk Lilith for being worried about the fact that her friend of many years was just taken by two psychopaths because Fuck you. So you're then sent back to Pandora to go and find her. You head back to Pandora to find Vaughn at a place called Roland's Rest, an obvious tribute to Roland's character after he was killed off in Borderlands 2. With his statue being there with messages from Lilith, Maud, Brick, Tina, and all the others written on it. I will finally stop giving this game some shit and commend it for once for producing something that actually works. This area and the statue alone was already enough, but they went the extra mile with all the heart-tugging messages from the other characters written on the side, including the picture of Tina and Roland from Borderlands 2. This area alone made me smile upon seeing it. This was a very heartwarming part of the game and I loved it to death. It's just a shame that none of the other parts of the story that try to get an emotional reaction out of the player can even measure up to this and the fact that this is used like two times. You head to the Splinterlands in order to enter Carnivora, a murder festival that Tannis is being held in in a race against time. But you know, of course you still get to loot all of the purple and blue weapons that the game is drowning you in at this point. Oh, and also another plus to the game for managing to get 
Penn and Teller to voice Pain and Terror as bad guys for this section. Teller, of course, steals the show with his amazing vocal performance, if you get what I'm saying. You manage to get to Pain and Terror on time and defeat the single best boss in the entire game. But afterwards, something happens. And you, you're gonna love this. This is not exaggerated. This is an accurate account of what happens in this shit house of a storyline. You destroy the Iridium core that is powering the Agonizer 9000, and then the chunks of Iridium begin to levitate upwards before cutting to Tannis as she starts glowing purple. Then a flash of light appears, and all of a sudden you find out that Tannis is a fucking siren. What the intergalactic cock? And she isn't just any siren either, because convenience and fan service is just just what we need at this moment, as Tannis was given siren powers after the death of Angel and explicitly says that she has Angel's powers. F fuck me! Let's just rewind and unpack everything that's just happened because God, what the fuck. Throughout your murderous rampage getting to an inside carnivora, Tannis says that she has a special ability to use, but says that if she uses it to escape then she will be killed. She says this in the same sentence and I'd like to remind you Tannis, you moldy bent, that escaping is called escaping. They cannot kill you if you escape, you have wings, fucking use them. There is literally several holes in the ceiling, the fucking fucking, the roof is made of cloth, it's cloth, fucking burst through, what the fuck? And the fact that this was supposed to be some sort of big reveal really fucks me off. They really thought that they were being subtle by having her lie and saying that she was using new technology. If by being subtle you mean taking the word subtlety and cramming it up your fucking rectum. And let's get onto the logistics of this. How the fuck does this work exactly? What was the space and time between Angel's death and Tannis receiving her powers? How the fuck did she get them anyway? Is it seriously just a case of having some random ass siren die just so their powers can be passed on? Who the hell on what plane of existence chooses who gets the powers? How do they get the powers? How the fuck does any of this work? This game is making me curmudgeonly. Has the line of sirens always worked? like this and why Tannis? That's arguably one of the few characters that giving siren powers to would make no sense at all but they fucking did it anyway. Good fucking job you mongoloidic bell sniffs. Maybe next time try giving us some explanations to how sirens work before introducing random ass moments in your contrived plot to progress the fucking story. Oh and I'm also not quite done with this fucking atrocity yet. How the fuck do you know that she's going to be a siren? Do you have a hunch that some odd fucker at the corner of the universe is going to give in, and that she'll release their powers. That makes no sense. You can't just bring her on this mission on the hunch that she'll actually do something, you great big flaming bitch. Why didn't Tannis at one point just use her siren abilities to fuck off out of Carnivora and through the visible cloth that holds the ceiling together, you witless fuck? We know for a damned fact that sirens only need Iridium to get stronger, not necessarily to do shit. You could have saved yourself, you bastard. And why was Tannis captured anyway? Did the Calypsos know about Tannis being a a siren? Because that would be pretty damn silly, wouldn't it? Did the Calypsos only decide to capture Tannis just to be dicks? If they could capture anyone from any distance, then why not get, oh, I don't know, the fucking Vault Hunters, Lilith, any of the Crimson Raiders? You could end everything right now, you cretinous fuck sticks, and before any of you say that Borderlands 2's story was contrived in places, I'd like to remind you that the contrivances in that game's story were a lot more reasonable and believable than the shit that this game tries to pull off. You're legit going to sit here and tell me that Tannis has had these siren abilities for over five fucking years at this point, and has never once thought to use them for when, oh, I don't know, when Sanctuary was attacked in the Commander Lilith DLC, when Lilith was attacked at the start of the game, or, you know, since she has Angel's powers and can phase shift, basically fix any sort of issue they were having in terms of tech or Sanctuary free. Phase shift could apparently do anything in Borderlands 2 from lowering shields to bypassing security. So I find it a bit hard to believe that it couldn't do any of that and Tannis just watched it happen. She literally could have fixed the heating problem in the lab earlier in the game. This is so fucked. You and Tannis head back to Sanctuary and Tannis tells everyone that the fabled Great Vault the Calypsos are talking about is actually real. And this is for some reason a massive shock to the characters, even though if they've killed like hundreds of people including other sirens just for this purpose it should be pretty apparent already you fucking muppet. Roland's rest is under attack from the CRV so you quickly help Vaughn take care of them before trying to launch an attack, but then getting pushed back by Troy after he reveals he's using Vaughn's stolen turrets. This entire segment is completely fucking
fucking useless and is made to pad out game time. And literally nothing happens when Tannis sends you to get an Iridium amplifier, so let's just skip ahead. Oh yeah, when we skip ahead to the actual story, my brain explodes from the utter stupidity. Let's see what we've got this time. Tyrene and Troy call you to inform you that Elpis, Pandora's moon, was the key to the Great Vault this entire time. And phase lock it all the way from Pandora, with Tyrene revealing that all of this time they could have just used Iridium instead of leeching people as the Iridium already amplifies their powers. Fucking awful. So you're going to tell me after all of this time, after killing Maya and making it out like you needed to leech the vault monsters to gain this much power, you suddenly realized it could all be accomplished by using the Iridium you were given. Fuck off. You cannot know. No, you did not know. You don't, you didn't do the fuck you. Fuck off. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck off. You piece of shit excuse for a story. You're telling me that you killed off a beloved character and had us do all of this running around for no fucking reason because the villains of the story were too dumb to realize until now that they could just use Iridium to phase lock Elpis. Are you fucking with my soul? You two are such senile twats. How did it seriously take you this fucking long to realize that you could just use Iridium, you crusty lobotomites? And holy hell, what was the point in having Maya get killed over all of this? If she had to die someplace in the story, then have it make sense first and have it be later on in the game. She got inserted into the story for like 15 minutes. That was it. And she got fucking murdered. Great writing. In fact, why did the Calypsos decide to full-on kill Maya and not just take her powers like they did with Lilith, you dumb cunt? Rick here might actually be more tolerable then, wouldn't she? Good god, the Iridium. Why does it charge up sirens for the love of twat? What is the connection between sirens and Iridium? Would you care to explain? Maybe then it would be a little more reasonable if the Calypso started using Iridium now as I would actually understand why Tyrene is being so cocky about it, the cackling toad. But there's literally no explanation and it fucking bothers me. Borderlands 2 script and story is on another plane of existence compared to this fucking sewage. You're about to begin your ground assault but first Lilith tells Prick to back up the Vault Hunters. And the Prick was right because they need to run towards the for what limp dildo wrote this bullshit. Prick is not right. She is not fucking right. How dare you try and make me think this is a good character. She's Fucking, uh, fucking whatever, fuck his story. Maya always told me a vault hunter runs toward the fire. Ava, you're not a vault hunter yet. There's a lot more to it than running headfirst into danger. Runs toward the fire. You piece of shit! Ah! You start your ground assault on the Cathedral of the Twin Gods and cut off Troy's Iridium supply. But then he starts using Tyrene to charge Elpis by leeching off of her. You finally face off against Troy and kill him with relative ease. Like, seriously. For someone with both Maya and Lilith's powers, it's just, what the fuck? He's ridiculously easy to take down. Why is he, what the fuck? You know, normally I would be fine with this, but fuck me, here's the part where things get really shitty. Troy was supposed to have some sort of arc in this game. He was always supposed to be subservient to his sister and do what she asked because otherwise he won't have a way to live as he needs to leech off of her. But when he leeches Maya and takes her powers, even though it made literally zero fucking sense, there was some potential here. You see that he starts becoming more independent and confident. Hell, Eden 6 is basically him doing all of the work. Even his dialogue of Tyrene changes and he starts opposing his sister and talking back to her. And now he's gotten to the point where he is literally trying to use his sister to charge Elpis even when it's clearly killing her. He could have been a decent villain at the end of the day with an actual character arc, as Tyrene gets literally no development at all. If they had Tyrene get killed here, then Troy would have been perfect for the final boss and the main antagonist, as he would have actually had some character growth. You know, just something to make him slightly three-dimensional. But because everyone on the writing team for this game took several shots of tequila before taking a massive piss on their half-baked script, here's what happens. Troy gets the peak of his arc, the moment that sets him up to grow and become the big bad of the entire game. He gets turned into a pathetic joke of a boss fight and dies with little to no emotion whatsoever. They just took a big fat massive fucking dump on his entire character arc before it could even get close to finishing. And now Tyrene, the least interesting out of the two, with zero development swaps places with Troy and takes his rightfully deserved place as the final boss. I have never seen a more narratively fucking borked video game than this and it's fucking Borderlands. It is not difficult to create a three-dimensional character in fucking Borderlands, you milkless hacks. And after that monumentally awful piece of storytelling, you wouldn't possibly believe something else could top it. But then something else happens, as Prick, final call the miserable tit her own name, Ava goes up to Troy, touches him for one second, 
and, and I am not fucking shitting you, instantly transfers Maya's powers to herself and becomes a siren. Truly fucking awful. Oh, fuck me, are you serious right now of this bullshit? How did she do that? Could anyone just touch a siren and take their powers this entire time? Was it not her touching him? Was it the gods of sirenage or whatever the fuck it fucking is that began to give out their power to some random and if it was then why was Ava their first choice? This miserable pile of fuck has done nothing the entire game but fuck everything up and stand around whining at everyone. Always putting the blame on other people and not taking responsibility for her actions. And now she gets Maya's powers and becomes a siren. Is this what Maya meant in terms of Ava becoming a siren and if so that brings up more questions. Like could she see this moment coming and by extension her own death? Why the hell would she not fucking prevent that. Can Sirens transfer their own powers to people? Was she planning on having Ava inherit her powers? I know for a fact that Sirens can choose their fucking successor now, thanks to this fucking balked piece of shit, but also given how Angel didn't choose a successor and how Maya is just saying that Ava becomes a fucking siren, what the fuck is going on? But whatever, Ava is just a fucking siren now because Lamau. She didn't do anything to deserve it, she just fucking ruins the entire game, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you piece of shit fucking campaign. Ava gets handed the vault key, which is now working apparently, they never showed us it working at all, but ah, uh, whatever. But then another thing happens, this fucking tismic story as Tyreen wakes up because the gormless tits that we call protagonist didn't check to see if she was dead as, you know, she was only being charged and Troy was the one to actually die. So as a result, Tyreen leeches Troy and reveals that there's a god underneath their feet and that apparently that god is the fucking destroyer. Cool, so Lilith and the original Vault Hunters didn't kill the destroyer in Borderlands 1. Way to go ahead and undermine the already underwhelming victory of that game, you massive degenerates. Tyreen then crushes Lilith, Tannis and Ava underneath a bunch of rocks and teleports away for some reason. Like, why, 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 why is she teleporting away? There's literally nothing else for her to do but stay here, and then the game ends. Nah, I'm just kidding, they do a fake teaser for a fourth game and then cut back to the scene. If you thought that was painfully unfunny of me, then that's because it was painfully unfunny in-game as well. And apparently, Ava just immediately learned how to use her powers and Lilith says that she catches on quick. Yeah, no shit she caught on quick, she shouldn't have caught on that quick for fuck's sake. You were literally just smashed and she visibly did not activate her powers when you were crushed for them for some fucking reason waited until Tyreen had left. Like, for fuck's sake, why are you all acting like morons? Just stop the bitch there dead in her tracks and end the fucking conflict you incestuous lemmings. I'd also like to remind you that the game is doing that thing again by having the vault hunters casually sit by and have a snack whilst Tyreen kills their friends. How are the rules of cutscenes more inconsistent than the pigeon shit on my mother's roof? How did you do that? How the fuck did you do that? Why did the vault hunters not exist in cutscenes? I am so fucking done at this point. Then apparently someone's echo is lying on the ground as Typhon de Leon, the first vault hunter on the other end. Who's echo is this? Is it Troy's? Tyreen's? Given the information late into the game, we know this would make sense, but Typhon talks as if this isn't the echo of one of his children, by asking if there's anyone there. And also, can we just talk about logistics of this? Typhon says that there's a massive light in the sky to indicate the Great Vault is opening, yet how does he know that? He's literally on the other side of the fucking universe? I doubt he can see Pandora and Elpis from where he's at, because then how is Necrotopheo that secret when it's not that far away from Pandora? Typhon tells you to get to Necrotopheo, the secret Iridian homeworld that you went missing to after vowing to find it. And I'm sorry, but what the fuck? Has Typhon ever seen the Great Vault open before? How does he know what it looks like? Where did this echo fucking come from? Who was murdered during the writing stage for this game? Just stop doing things, game. Every time you reveal something, it somehow ruins my love for this franchise. Just please fucking stop. You head back to Sanctuary and set a course for Necrotopheo, which... What? Can you now track coordinates off of Echo, or did the game seriously just pull a rabbit out of its ass by randomly allowing us to find the secret Iridian homeworld without any explanation as to how we know where to set a course? If it is seriously this fucking easy, then how has no one done this before? And you finally get there and see the purple beam that Typhon was- w wait, what? why is there a beam coming out? Does this seriously reach all the way to Elpis? Is that why we're able to find this place so easily? How in the hell does the charging of Elpis somehow link 
back to here. Oh my fucking head, fuck the story. And more fuck ups away as Malawan has somehow managed to set up camp on the secret Iridium homeworld that no one knows about and the game completely shrugs it off with no explanation. And if there is one that I don't know about, then I'm sorry but I don't bloody see it. In fact, how is it that these fucking gremlins have managed to travel all the way to Necrotefeo in the hour it's been since Troy started charging Elpis? And how could they have known where the beam was going? Why did they decide to follow the beam? Aren't they still in the middle of a corporate war with Atlas? And don't say that the war is finished because the assault and black site mission you get at level 50 begs to differ. In fact, they've set up full-on camps on this fucking place and fully militarized it all within the span of an hour. How? You head down to Necrotefeo and you're greeted by Typhon de Leon's robots, Grouse and Sparrow, who are used like a few times. Why? And you finally meet Mr. Typhon de Leon, he's in the game for about an hour. Cool. And he's also short. Th th that's the joke. Fuck your intelligence. Typhon explains that the Iridians built a machine capable of locking away the destroyer and that it can be used again, but that it requires all four vault keys to be used. You're carrying three of them. For, for some reason, seriously, what? So you insert them quickly and face off against Malawan where Captain Crunch's brother, Captain Crunch Cinnamon Roll Flavor, just rolls off the tongue that, tries to seek vengeance on you to prove that his cereal is obviously better. But you've had an epiphany as of late and realize that Weetabix is all you need for the perfect start to your day, leaving him completely feckless as he fucking explodes. Typhon slowly reveals to you that the Calypsos are actually his kids and that he was the one to tell him about the Great Vault, which is character depth, I suppose. You stop Malawan from trying to open a vault that that Typhon has already looted because, sure, let's try and loot the vault on the planet that is known to be the location of the first vault hunter and expect it to not be looted, you burnt piece of celery. You take the elevator to the vault, Typhon explains that him and his wife had sex with each other on the elevator that you're standing on, which I think was supposed to be humour. Suddenly Tyrene! Yes, Tyrene feels like she needs to tell you what's currently happening in the story for like the billionth time and also informs Typhon that you killed Troy. And we actually get an interesting response from Typhon. Not only does he understand that it was your job and that his son was a monster and so isn't angry with you, but you can still tell that he feels sorrow for the death of his son, which actually is character depth. Holy shite, this game actually managed to do something on par Borderlands 2 for once. I'm actually really happy with that. Please tell me we get to learn more about this character in the story instead of just putting his backstory in an optional side mission. Uh, you and Typhon obtained a mayonnaise planet vault key, which Tannis asks Ava to help her charge, which... why? Why do you need help to charge the key? You could do it on your own earlier. Also, I find it rich that Ava doesn't know how to do something as simple as charging a vault key, yet she managed to enable god mode immediately after obtaining Maya's powers. Oops. Oh, and we finally get an answer to why the vaults on Eden 6 and Promethea are connected, and it still doesn't make any sense to me as to why these very specific locations were chosen, especially ones that are the homes of two major corporations. Quite convenient, wouldn't you say? You enter the machine with Typhon and Tannis and are told to put the vault keys in statues that will close Pandora because sure it will. And I'm still confused as to how you have these fucking vault keys when they were needed to activate the fucking bridge to get to the machine. Oops. Pandora is still opening, so Tanis does some siren stuff, and also Lilith and Ava are here because... Cool. Oh, now I know why they're here, because suddenly Tyrene! Fuck me, you love making an entrance at the worst possible moment, don't you? I don't think there's a single point in this game where you're even remotely one step behind us. In fact, where is Tyrene's character? Who is this shower of shit, and why does she have glimpses of something much deeper? Deeper, but can never fucking reach being good. Why does she have literally no character flaws whatsoever? She has her emo rant towards her father, which is definitely what I want to listen to when I'm trying to kill the hundreds of endlessly spawning goons you're sending after me. Seriously, game. I am playing on normal fucking difficulty. Just stop the awful. You're nearly done, but Tyrene decides to walk towards Ava's barrier, somehow teleport herself in using Lilith's powers, even though the entire goddamn point of that barrier is to stop things from entering entering, and Lilith's powers have you come down from the fucking sky. So in reality, if she did try to do this in a world which is narratively cohesive, she would have smacked her face on the barrier like a Looney Tunes short and proceed to lose as Pandora is closed. This is so borked, but that isn't even the worst part. Tyrene teleports in front of Tannis, poses like a cat getting ready for a high stakes cockfight, then has her lifeless animation rig slowly slap the ground like a wet flannel and push everyone away, and it is the funniest shit I have ever ever seen come from a video game cutscene. Oh, and it isn't over as Lilith has a fucking tism as she holds up a gun to Tyrene's face, shoots, 
has the most delayed reaction ever as Tyrene teleports away, and then Tyrene literally teleports a meter away from where she is to start choking Lilith out. How can so many cock-ups exist in one scene? This game is smoking a piece of cardboard. Typhon saves Lilith by grabbing Tyrene with the whip, Bit sexual, but okay. Tyrene calls Typhon a scared old man, with the worst delivery I've heard since this kid from The Phantom Menace. You scared old man! Come on, let's go and play ball. And then she grabs him, and Typhon detonates a grenade, only for Tyrene to somehow charge up the explosion that is blasted into her face, and to fire it back at Typhon, which ends up killing him. What the f- how is Tyree not the least bit affected by the fact that a grenade just went off in her fucking face? Even if she did charge it up and fire it back, that explosion is right on her and near enough to cause damage. Not to mention, how the hell does this make any sense? Is this one of Lilith's powers, or did Tyrene legitimately just break the fucking story in two and phase lock the explosion? Is there an explanation for this? Tyrene doesn't have Maya's powers for fuck's sake, how did she do that? Typhon dies and gives absolutely terrible delivery with his last lines, which are practically screaming for you to feel sad. Tanis says she's able to create a portal to Pandora, which... Sure, not like that's ever gonna get elaborated on. Fucking, how many questions do you have to bring up regarding sirens? Jesus Christ, what a waste. Lilith then thanks you for saving them hundreds of times, which is rich because the game did that thing again, where the Vault Hunters don't fucking exist in cutscenes. Oops. Oh, she also says that she felt like she belongs in the front lines, yet now has to stand aside and let you finish the job, and fuck me. Lilith, you stood on Sanctuary for literally the entire campaign. You haven't done fucking anything. Shut up. Finally, you head down to Pandora for one final confrontation with Tyrene, but it appears to be too late as she fuses with the Destroyer because... Sure. Oh, and you get to fight what might take the cake as the worst boss fight in the entire game. It's not even remotely difficult, it's just so fucking boring, it took me like 20 minutes to finish. So yeah, f fuck this fight. You had the chance to make the destroyer an actual threat and you still managed to cock it up. Cool, I hate it. Tyrene is finally killed and just disappears, there's no cutscene or anything, she's just gone. Fantastic writing. And then Lilith is just there, like cool, I guess. Oh, and the Vault Hunters aren't in the cutscene anymore, despite the fact that they should be right in front of Lilith. Oops. Lilith gets her siren powers back, and everything seems fine, and then Ava starts talking again. We get the final cutscene in the game, where Tannis reveals that there is no way to stop the Great Vault from opening, and that Pandora is doomed. And really, I would be perfectly content if this game went the route of actually destroying Pandora for good. I mean, we've been on this shithole for like, three games now. But what happens next comes out of absolutely nowhere. And I'm just going to go over it. Lilith looks down at her hand and then says, run towards the fire. Quoting what Ava said to her early on in the game when she was blamed for Maya's death unjustly. She then turns to Ava and says to her that Sanctuary is hers now and that she is officially Lilith's successor. She then runs towards Elpis and then flies up to it, with everyone except Ava questioning what she is doing. And Ava says that she's going to close the Great Vault and save Pandora. Lilith then teleports in into Elpis, or I don't know, she just poofs out of existence, and then we get shots of all of the characters looking up at Elpis, even those from Eden 6 and Promethea. Ava then says that Lilith is not dead, but is instead lighting the way, as we see that Elpis is now covered with the Firehawk. And then the game ends, just like that. Truly fucking awful. Oh boy, where do I begin with this? Well, I guess I could begin with what the fuck? Let's break this ending down because good lord what a miserable train wreck. Firstly, the pacing. What the fuck is happening with the pacing here? Tyrene goes down and then nothing else happens, she just disappears. No cutscenes with her last words or reaction, no satisfying payoff, she's dead. She's just dead. Then we fucking skip past that and move on to a cutscene where in literally 25 seconds of it starting, Lilith is just suddenly like, Welp, guess I'll die, and fucks off. The game then ends on a single line from Ava that feels incomplete. Like, there was an entire section here that got cut out during the writing stage for this game. This entire section does not feel satisfying. It doesn't feel meaningful. It feels so bloody rushed to the point where it's almost comical. There is no build-up to this moment, no character building that leads to this moment of Lilith sacrificing herself. It is a complete and utter failure of trying to shoehorn in a sad moment at the end of your shitty campaign. Secondly, I find 
find it so fucking rich how much this ending is trying to make itself look meaningful or compelling. The music and character reactions say it all, seriously. They really wanted to end their game in a way that was emotionally compelling and it fell flat on its epic exclusive ass. Thirdly, why the fuck is Ava Lilith's choice for a successor when both Brick and Mordecai are still alive and kicking? And the fact that Ava has been a miserable sod the entire game, blamed Lilith for Maya's death, told her nonsense about running towards the fire as opposed to actually thinking like a human being, is constantly moaning about fucking everything and gets Maya's powers cuz Mao. In fact, why are Brick, Mordecai and especially Tina so underused in this game's story? These are arguably the three most important characters to Lilith's story in past. The Vault Hunter she fought with and became friends with, held Tina saw Lilith's boyfriend Roland as a father figure, and yet these important characters are thrown aside in favour of a snarky, whiny child. Suck a fucking egg, you piece of shit storyline. Fourthly, speaking of those three, why the hell is no one attempting to leave Pandora and why are Tina, Brick and Mordecai just doing some random bullshit whilst the planet is literally splitting? Given their relations to Lilith and the Crimson Raiders, Vaughn, Tina, Brick, Mordecai and as many people in Roland's rest as possible should be evacuating into Sanctuary. So why the hell is none of that happening? Why is there no sense of panic from anyone here? In fact, how the fuck is Prometheus shaking here? And how are they able to see what's happening to Elpis? The shaking is happening to Pandora, you twats. How is anyone able to see in detail what's happening? And why do Hammerlock and Wainwright treat this as some sort of meaningful moment when they literally have no clue what is happening? Is there any care placed into logic? Does anyone fucking care? Fifthly, how does Lilith do this? What the fuck are her powers right now? Does she just get absorbed into Elpis? What? Remember in Fight for Sanctuary where she was struggling with Hector? How the fuck is this now possible? How long can she hold this for? Does anyone care to explain? It feels like they just went, well she has superpowers, she can just do whatever she wants and we ended up with this mess, fucking Papega. So yeah, Lilith isn't exactly dead but is only mostly dead as she is lighting the way for something and stopping Elpis from tearing Pandora apart. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. She's lighting the way. And that was the story for Borderlands 3. And I don't think I have ever watched a video game story that insulted my intelligence and love for the world and characters this much in my entire fucking life. This has to be one of the worst stories that I have ever ever played through. Now don't get me wrong, I think Borderlands 3 is a great game in its own right, and this is the best Borderlands game if we're talking about gameplay, but in terms of story, j j Jesus fucking, what the fuck, I think it might be worse than the first game's story, and that game didn't even have much of a story to begin with. In fact, I'd rather sit through Sonic 06's story than this bullshit, because even with that story's endless supply of plot holes, contrivances, contradictions and all, you can still watch it happen and get pure enjoyment from how terrible it is. Borderlands 3 story on the other hand, to me anyway, is the Borderlands equivalent to The Last Jedi. The utterly broken script that this game follows shoots itself in the foot every time it progresses, adding more contrivances and holes to the overall Borderlands canon with every breath. The Children of the Vault are just allowed to rise out of nowhere because Lilith is too much of a cockwoggle to see it happening and she's too focused on finding a map that's on the same damn planet that it's happening on. And the Crimson Raiders are sent all the way back down to square one like they were in Borderlands 2. It treats the characters with such disrespect and believes that killing beloved characters for no reason is a good way to generate an emotional reaction and to give your story depth. What makes a death like Tony Stark's work is the fact that his death actually makes sense for his character. It was a very in-character thing to do as throughout the entire MCU he has been trying to sacrifice himself for the safety of the world, nay the entire universe. And not only does it make sense, it also doesn't act like a spit in the face to people who loved and got invested in his character. It feels perfectly in line and a perfect send-off, which is why people cried when Tony died, because it wasn't a disrespectful move. Hell, I cried when Tony died, but Maya's death just feels insulting. The treatment of other characters like Aurelia, where they completely trample her character 
Hunter arc and kill her off. The Borderlands 2 Vault Hunters by not having them appear. The original Vault Hunters and Tina for not having them involved with a story that is integral to their best friend. And Lilith for turning her into an emotionless blank slate who kneels down to the angry and irrational words of a child. Oh, and the new characters can all go fuck themselves. With the exception of Wainwright, like the very, very exception of Wainwright, every new character in Borderlands 3 is either a plank of wood or an embarrassing attempt at being funny or deep. That always comes off as cringeworthy and frustrating whenever they're on screen. The only character I got slightly invested in was Typhon de Leon, and even then it was because I went out of my way to 100% this game and stumbled across the audio logs of his backstory. This is integral to understanding this character, and it's a shame how the only three-dimensional character in this game is killed about an hour after you meet him. Ava is the single worst self-insert fan character to ever be inserted into this franchise. She is an utter fucking nightmare to listen to, treats Lilith like absolute dog shit, and convinces her to sacrifice herself at the end out of bloody nowhere, and just gets to be a siren with Maya's powers when there is batshit inane reasoning I could think of. And it's actually embarrassing to think that the game wants you to like and sympathise with this walking, talking vagina piercing. She is literally zero character progression and acts as a miserable stain on the Borderlands canon. Not even Pickle acted as a bigger brain tumour to the story as much as this whiny fuck. All of the other beloved and present characters who people have gotten to know throughout the last 10 years now have the depth and intelligence of a teaspoon. Lilith does fuck all throughout the entire game and when she does do something it is so questionably out of character that I'm considering it canon that she's actually just an emotional grandma wearing her skin and that the Lilith we know was actually killed during the five years between Fight for Sanctuary and now. Tannis being a siren is the most disgustingly convenient element of the game's story and the thought of it nearly causes me to fade into a fucking coma. The vaults are a complete and utter joke and I don't even want to get into how much of a missed opportunity opportunity it was to not do anything exciting with them. There are so many moments in this game where logic is tied against the bed and tortured. Numerous scenes that make no sense whatsoever and are littered with holes and helpy handings of disgusting convenience. The Calypso twins are a fucking joke. They had serious potential to be great characters and I went into this not even expecting them to be handsome Jack level. But fuck they were terrible. Horribly written, painfully unfunny, disgustingly overpowered and are never a step behind. There's never a sign of weakness in either of them, and the only interesting idea they had with Troy being envious of his sister goes absolutely nowhere, and by the end of the game they get no send off at all, they just disappear, absolutely fucking stunning. Sirens are just there now, they are just all powerful beings for the sake of it, no explanation of their history, even in Nereid's echo logs, which in fact add more questions as Sirens don't even know what their purpose is or their connection with the Iridians. And apparently according to Nereid, there is a seventh Siren, fucking why? What the fuck is happening in this universe? I'm not even going to get into that. Apparently siren powers are just thrown into the universe upon when a siren dies, which makes literally no sense. And the fact that Tannis has Angel's own phase shift powers is a fucking joke. You could have at least made this less of a detriment to your story by having it be that only when people are born they can become sirens. But now you have it be that any random fucker can just obtain siren powers out of nowhere and do not even get me started on how Ava got her powers by touching Troy for a fucking sec- Who? The fuck? wrote this. Troy and Tyrene thought that Troy could only take from his sister until the moment where Troy is in trouble, where he just decided to touch Maya without any knowledge of it working. Meaning that he isn't a defect siren like Tyrene thought he was because he actually has the leech powers. Do you remember your own established rules, you fucking awful story? How can a human just touch a siren and obtain their goddamn powers? I thought the whole point of a siren dying was that their powers were thrown into the universe and how can a human again just touch a fucking siren and get their fucking powers? The entire concept and idea of sirens has been completely borked in one game. The plot relies so heavily on them, it's fucking laughable. Entire pieces of the ongoing plot are completely thrown aside and forgotten about, and there are so many loose ends that are not tied up. What happened at the end of Tales from the Borderlands? What war was the Watcher talking about in the pre-sequel? Is Borderlands 4 going to follow up on any of these? How the fuck was this not the war that the Watcher was talking about? Fuck this utter mess. And really that's all I I can say regarding this story. It is a fuck up of the highest order. A slap in the face to people who cared for the story and world and characters of this franchise. There is nothing else to say other than I hope that when Borderlands 4 comes out in like seven more years from now, they actually get their shit together and write a better story. Write something that's respectful to this franchise instead of this miserable pile of shit that you gave us. Also maybe like optimize your fucking game properly next time.